What's going on, guys? And welcome back into the Brendan Schaefer St. Louis Cardinals writer YouTube channel. Sitting here with some Cardinals news that just dropped a little bit ago on Monday afternoon. Heim Bloom is now a member of the St. Louis Cardinals, at least in an advisory capacity to president of baseball operations, John Mosaloc. Of course, Heim Bloom from late October of 2019 until just this past September was running the Boston Red Sox as their chief baseball officer. Before that, he was a longtime executive of the Tampa Bay Rays, actually started with the Rays back in 2005 as an intern, did Heim Bloom, and worked all the way up to, I believe he finished as the second in command, essentially with the Tampa Bay Rays before he left in October of 2019 to take over the Red Sox organization. But this is big news, I think, for the Cardinals. We're going to have a lot of reaction and discussion and reflection of this news coming up in the next few days on this channel. But I wanted to hop on right before my radio show on KTGR to just give some instant reaction to the news, which is something that had been reported as a possibility much earlier this offseason. I think all the way going back to November, it was whispered that this could be something the Cardinals would look to do. And I think now that it's been announced in an official capacity, you could make the argument that Heim Bloom has been advising John Mozeliak and the Cardinals all offseason when you look back at some of the pitchers that they have added, I think it's really interesting to kind of follow the breadcrumbs. Obviously, we haven't got a chance to talk to John Mozeliak as the media about this hiring yet. That'll be something that comes as early as this weekend, uh, un unless he does an exclusive with a, a reporter or something like that. He'll do a public press conference at the winter warm-up this coming weekend in St. Louis. So just a handful of days from now where we'll get a chance to kind of know exactly what maybe went down behind this hiring and, and more information from Mo because I can remember back at the winter meetings in Nashville, Mozeliak was asked several questions about Heimblum and the possibility of hiring him in some sort of front office role. And he was a little cagey in terms of the responses because the Cardinals hadn't actually officially um, done anything in that capacity yet, at least that they were ready to announce. Like maybe it is the case that Heim Bloom was in, in a more official capacity then, and they just weren't ready to announce it. I'm not entirely sure. It'll be interesting to kind of get more information on that. Uh, but you can look at some of the names the Cardinals have picked up this offseason, and you can see Heim Bloom's fingerprints all over some of these pitchers, including Ryan Fernandez, who was the Cardinals' Rule 5 draft pick from the Boston Red Sox. That was back in early December. The Tyler O'Neill trade, they got Nick Robertson as one of the pitchers that they picked up. In that deal, that's another guy that came from Boston. Uh, Victor Santos, I believe, was also a part of that Tyler O'Neill trade, but a little lower in terms of his um, just his organizational standing and a lower level of the minors. Nick Robertson, you'd have to assume, is coming to spring training with an opportunity to compete for a role this season for the Cardinals. So that's uh, another name of note, uh, I would have to imagine. Another one that just I came to my attention just looking up because I got kind of curious as to the Tampa Bay Rays and some of the drafts that they had. And, and I was curious, well, who did they draft that we know that went on to become a successful major league pitcher? And I noticed there in 2017, the Tampa Bay Rays drafted Riley O'Brien, which is a guy the Cardinals traded for back in early November from the Mariners. Now, O'Brien was drafted by the Rays, but was, you know, however he ended up on the Mariners, I didn't go that far down the trade tree. But I think it was a cash considerations deal, if I'm not mistaken, that happened in early November, the Cardinals picking up O'Brien. And already I've seen some things on him, if you're kind of following social media this offseason, about his upper 90s fastball and, and some of the different things he's doing in the pitching labs trying to get ready for the season. It's like you can make a connection there and say, well, maybe that's another guy that if, if Heim Bloom was already advising the Cardinals, uh, he would have had familiarity with uh, for sure. Like, it, we don't really know the extent necessarily on some of these. Obviously, another one is Andrew Kittredge. The Cardinals just making that trade this week. We talked about on the channel already. Scroll back if you want my take on that trade, kind of reflecting on what it means for the Cardinals bullpen. Uh, St. Louis sent Richie Palacios for Andrew Kittredge, a right-handed reliever, a veteran reliever from the Tampa Bay Rays, a former 2021 All-Star. So, like, that's another name that obviously Bloom would have had familiarity with. And so maybe the extent to which he's responsible for these moves, I guess, could be called into some level of question. But advising in those moves for sure seems to be the case. And it's kind of crazy that the Cardinals add four players in an offseason. And that's only the four that I've noticed. Let me know if there are others that have slipped through that. Oh, yeah, Kyle Bloom would have had uh, a relationship or, or a familiarity with another player, uh, perhaps along the way. 
all in the same offseason and then in early January announcing that the, the Cardinals have officially hired Bloom in an advisory role to president of baseball operations, John Moselak. I'm just going to read from the official statement from the Cardinals that they released earlier Monday afternoon where Mo says, quote, I have known Heim for a long time and feel that this is a great opportunity for the St. Louis Cardinals. It will be good to get an outside perspective of our organization from someone who is as well-respected as Heim. Having a fresh set of eyes on all aspects of our baseball operations should be helpful. And for Bloom's part, he said in the statement, quote, I'm excited to join the Cardinals and to be a part of this great organization. Mo and his team have given me such warm welcome, and I'm eager to, uh, to build relationships here and learn, contribute, and help us win. So that's from Heim Bloom, new advisor to the Cardinals front office, and Pobo John Moselak. But it's interesting. I wouldn't expect to see anything revelatory necessarily in a, a controlled statement like that from the team. But Mo saying, hey, a fresh set of eyes on all aspects of our operations should be helpful. And I think that's something that Cardinals fans have maybe been asking for for some time because you kind of get into that little thought bubble as, a, as an organization as an, and as a front office when continually all of the hires come from within and you guys that are working their way up, guys and gals, which can be a great thing. But also at a certain point, could certain ideas grow stale? Could it just be nice to have uh, another perspective that could offer some outside influence and say, well, the way we did things in Tampa or the way we did things in Boston, maybe this would be something that the Cardinals could find useful. Um, I think it's a great hire, personally. It's something that I've talked about on B-Shape Daily this offseason. And one of the leading questions, I think, from Cardinals fans about this move will be, well, does that mean that Heim Bloom is next in command to take over for John Moselock in a couple of years? I'm not going to say definitively that that's the case, but I'd have him as the odds-on favorite as of today. Yes, that would be my prediction if you, you made me give one. It's not to say that Randy Flores is not a good guess. It's not to say that Mike Gersh would not be a good guess, but I could absolutely see it being the case. Heim Bloom, only 40 years old, by the way. He took over as the lead executive for the Red Sox when he was just 36 years old. Very uh, young and green in terms of, you know, years of experience. But uh, again, uh, an intern in 2005 for the Tampa Bay Rays in 2008 wrote the Rays Way Handbook. I haven't been able to find a lot more information on that necessarily, um, but multiple articles I saw um, talking about that, I'd like to maybe read more about what that entails, but the, the, the player development handbook essentially for their prospects. And I would venture to say that it's worked out pretty well in terms of if you look at where the Rays are consistently ranked on prospect lists and, and, and some of the talent that they have turned out to be able to have the success that they've had in Tampa without always having the highest of payrolls. And I, I can even go further and say their payrolls are always near the bottom of the league, right? And anytime they get a player that's going to command a salary, look at a Tyler Glass now this year, they're they're finding ways to trade those players um, for the next in command, the next guys that are going to be able to come up and help that organization win. Um, a lot of the Rays' actual winning has taken place after Heim Bloom left, but you can't argue with the you know the 2014s and 15s and 16s and 17s and 18 and 19 when they had a winning season. Um, I believe they made it pretty far in the playoffs that that year as well, off memory, that he was a part of orchestrating all of those teams and and doing the building behind the scenes for a lot of those teams. And I think in particular from a pitching perspective, there's a, a, a long-form article that I believe was by Tom Verducci um, talking about one of those Rays teams. It's been several years since this has been written. Um, I believe Bloom was still with the Rays when it was written, uh, but just talking about a lot of the elements of that organization and basically – raving about their ability to identify and develop pitching talent. And if that's not the exact thing that I think a lot of Cardinals fans have looked at as maybe a deficit with the St. Louis organization in recent years, I don't know if there's anything that could hit the nail on the head any more clearly and any more firmly than that. The Cardinals have not had as much success, although I did see a, um, I forget the source on it, but I saw it shared to my timeline on Twitter earlier today about the Cardinals actually ranking number one in terms of developing you know, pitchers that that then make the big leagues and make an impact. Um, but a lot of those guys making impact for, first of all, other organizations, like if you want to tout Zach Gallen, um, which I believe that that article did, he, he ended up doing that for other organizations, which is, you know, kind of a blessing and a curse for the Cardinals because you can say, well, they're responsible for identifying him and kind of getting him his start. But then ultimately, you know, you don't get to reap the benefits of his performance at the big league level. Um, that uh, actually ends up going to the Diamondbacks after he was traded away um, to the Marlins and then from the Marlins to Arizona. 
but just in, in general, the Cardinals as a, a pitching development organization and being able to look in their rotation and say, oh, yeah, we brought that guy up through our system, and now as a, a cost-controlled player for three years before arbitration and then three years during arbitration as the salary begins to rise, the Cardinals have benefited from this player reaching his potential and, and doing great things for the team in St. Louis. You haven't really been able to say that recently, right? Jack Flaherty is an example of a guy that was drafted, developed, and came through the system and, and had all the six years until he was traded a couple of months short of his free agency and then goes and signs a solid one-year deal with the Tigers. But, like, you would probably say that he fell short of expectations with the Cardinals. And injuries are a reason for that, and, and there are lots of reasons that a given player or pitcher can fall short of of the hopes or the expectations that you might have. But, like, Flaherty was the best example in terms of recent years, Cardinals pitchers that are drafted, developed, and then make it. And in, in, in retrospect, at the end of his time with the Cardinals, he signs a one-year deal, right? It's not like the Cardinals turned him out and he turned into a guy that was commanding um, nine figures on the free agent market. He gets a one-year contract. You know, you can think about names like Alex Reyes. That's another example of an injury that happens to a promising prospect to ultimately force him to fall short of his hopes and expectations with the Cardinals. But it's just been a number of those types of stories where the Cardinals have not been able to solve these issues in their rotation with internal options in recent years. Like, that's been one of the, the primary issues with the team. And you can look at last year's team and say, well, they, you know, they they, they just cheaped out and they didn't really get the, the guys that were going to be answers in the rotation. They paid six starting pitchers last year. Like, Adam Wainwright was getting paid $18 million. I know a lot of it deferred. But Miles Michaels had a contract. Even Dakota Hudson was into the, the the millions in terms of his salary for the year. Jack Flaherty, another example. Steven Matz was a the guy they went out and signed in for agency. So, like, you can look up and down their rotation. I may have neglected a name there, but they had a full rotation of Jordan Montgomery, obviously getting paid, like, 10 mil for the season. So, like, that's six guys that they that they were paying major league salaries and not we're not talking about minimum salaries. They just didn't have the right mixture and the right guys to be able to get it done in that group. And you can also look at it and, and say it's kind of a, a blight on the organization that while some of those guys were internal guys that came up through the system, Wainwright was obviously an example of that, even though they weren't, uh, he wasn't drafted by the Cardinals, acquired long, long ago in the J.D. Drew trade. Like they traded for Montgomery, but were paying him. They signed Steven Matz. They signed Miles Michaelis. They didn't have that up and comer that, was a young guy, which is good to have those in your organization, but that could take the reins and be like, yeah, I am 24 years old, 25 years old, and I am a mainstay in the rotation. The Cardinals have not developed that player in a long, long time and outside of Jack Flaherty even longer um, to fully reach the potential that you'd hope to see from a top prospect type of guy. So I think Heim Bloom, if nothing else, can be a, a, a shepherd, hopefully, in that regard to the Cardinals organization. Um, the guy is sharp. Look, you can you can criticize what happened with his tenure in Boston. And, and again, this is going to be a quick video. I'm going to wrap it up here shortly because I got to get to my radio show and prepare for that. But uh, we're going to do a lot more conversation about this. So drop in the YouTube comment section below more questions that you might have for upcoming videos as we continue to dissect this topic throughout the week. Um, because I think it may be the Cardinals' biggest move of the offseason to add Bloom to the organization and to hopefully have him be a guide to sort of um, redirect wherever they are in terms of pitching. There's there's some sharp people in the organization that I think probably uh, have a good handle on things from a pitching standpoint, but it cannot hurt to bring in a guy like Bloom with the inarguable success that he had with Tampa. With the Red Sox, my quick take on his tenure there is, again, October 2019 hired, fired not even four years later in September of 2023. First of all, I think the Red Sox, when they hired him, it's like, they're, they're trying to slash payroll. That's how the Mookie Betts trade happened. You can blame Heim Bloom for that trade, or you can acknowledge that ownership in Boston was not willing to play ball with, with the, you know, the likes of the Yankees and the AL East in terms of where they were at from a payroll perspective. And so Mookie Betts being re-signed was probably not on the table. And Heim Bloom, I, 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 my belief is he tried to make the most of the situation. And I don't think the trade worked out, obviously, but um, sometimes people forget that the president of baseball operations has to operate under the parameters given by ownership. And so I don't necessarily hold all of that to Heim Bloom. I don't think it was a case of, hey, you know what might be fun? We could go trade Mookie Betts, one of the best players of baseball. I think it was more like, okay, it seems that we're not going to be able to resign this guy. So how can we best leverage the asset in order to try and get something for him and rebuild in a way that makes sense. 
Um, you know, that's a, a, a tough place to begin when your your conclusion is that the guy's got to be traded. So I don't totally hold him responsible for that. And if they had gotten better players and, you know, Verdugo was has been a fine outfielder and he's not on the Red Sox anymore, but, you know, they make some of these moves and it just didn't pan out. I also think, though, under those parameters, ownership should have realized that you were kind of asking uh, an impossible task and one that might take more years to do. And you can make the case that the, the work that Heim Bloom did while in Boston has maybe not all yet been realized by the major league club because of the work that he did kind of reorganizing the minor leagues for that organization. And I would imagine that Boston's going to um, graduate some prospects over the next couple of years that you're going to be able to look back and say, oh, Heim Bloom had a lot to do with that. So I don't really hold Boston against him too much in terms of, you know, what his role is with the Cardinals now. Again, he's just an advisor. Um, but we know that John Mozeliak's contract is up after a couple more years following 2025. That's it. And if you if you take him at the word that he that he shared 11 months ago in in the uh, the Jupiter Florida complex patio outside the Cardinals clubhouse, he basically alluded to the fact that this is going to be his final contract with the Cardinals as the lead baseball executive. So I think it, it makes sense to do a little bit of dot connecting. It makes sense to realize that uh, the Cardinals have gone out and gotten four pitchers that had previous ties or at least Bloom would have been familiar with. Um, to and, and I don't think it's a, a stretch to say he rubber stamped those moves at a minimum, uh, recommended them at a minimum, and, and at a maximum, he may have been instrumental in, in kind of guiding the Cardinals toward like, hey, these are some guys that are worth considering um, as whatever conversations took place. He's officially now in an advisor role. I think it's a great thing for the Cardinals. Whether it means for sure that he takes over for Mo in a couple of years, I don't think we can say that just yet. But I think there's reason to believe that if the next couple of years go well and, and um, Bill DeWitt, more than anything, is impressed by kind of uh, the, the acumen of, of Heim Bloom, it would definitely not be crazy um, to imagine a world in which those things take place. So I'm, I'm very intrigued. I think Cardinals fans should be encouraged by the move. But let me know what questions you have because we're going to continue to dive in in depth in discussing it over the coming days, kind of leading into winter warm-up where we'll have a, a new influx of news and topics of conversation to talk about. We're almost through the lean period of the offseason, which means that with B-Shape Daily and with everything that we do on the channel, it's going to start to get hot and heavy uh, in, in a good way. So appreciate you guys for joining me. As always, make sure you hit that subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Tell your friends who are Cardinals fans about what we're doing here on the channel. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the podcast version of the show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. I don't think this one will even be on Spotify necessarily, um, but but we'll see. A lot of good stuff, though, to come in, uh, in terms of what I write for KMOV and right here on YouTube in 2024. Thank you guys so much for watching, for listening, and for sticking with me all offseason. We'll talk to you next time on the channel. Peace.